Okay, Pastor CJ. All right, well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to put that coffee down before I drop it all over myself. That would not end well. But I do appreciate the opportunity to be here with everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you, and I thank you all for coming out and being with us here this morning. It's uh, always an honor and a privilege to speak in another pastor's pulpit, and I don't take that lightly. I think that you have a great pastor here. I think that you have a great church, and I hope that you treasure it and that you value it, especially in the days ahead, because we all know that things aren't getting any easier. They're going to get more interesting, and they're definitely going to get more involved as we go forward and as we get closer to the end days. So definitely appreciate the church and appreciate one another that makes up the church. Don't lose your value of the church because Jesus Christ really values the church. He values this church just as he values each and every one of us. Now, the church is not made up of names. It's not made up of denominations. The church is made up of individuals. Everyone who's saved, everyone who's accepted Jesus Christ as their savior is a part of the church of Jesus Christ. And so you are a part of the church. And Jesus Christ loved that church. He loved you so much that he died on the cross for you. And then he conquered sin and death and hell and rose again that third day, giving us assurance, giving us a certainty, not a hope in the sense of, well, maybe, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, but a sense and a certainty. I know what's going to happen when I leave this earth, whether that's in the rapture or through death. And the Bible testifies of how much Jesus Christ loves the church, how much he loves us. And sometimes we don't appreciate that love the way that we should. Sometimes we don't fully realize what that love is all about. And that's what I hope to accomplish here today. One of the things that I hope to accomplish during this morning service is to take a look at a picture of how much Christ loves the church, how much he loves you, and allow that to impact our relationship with him this morning. Now, the Song of Solomon is a very interesting book in the Bible. There are a lot of misconceptions about the Song of Solomon. One of the truths of Scripture is that what you go to the Bible expecting to find, you will find. You can make the Bible say anything that you want it to. If you pick and choose and if you yank verses out of context, you can make it back up whatever you want to make it back up. And if you go into the Song of Solomon trying to find a rowdy, raunchy tale, you'll find it. You can make it say that. But that's not what the Song of Solomon really is. If you take a step back and if you look at the Song of Solomon for what it is, for what it testifies of itself, you do find it to be the Song of Songs. You do find it to be a wonderful ballad, an opera, a song that's meant to be sung and conveys a story of real, true, genuine romance. We know from verse 1, and I hope you have your Bibles with you here today, as you're definitely going to want to be referencing the Song of Solomon as we go through this little book. I'm going to try and cover as much of it as I can in the next 40 minutes and show you how not only does this testify of real, genuine human love, but it also testifies of the level of love that Jesus Christ has for the church. It's one thing to say that God loves us. It's one thing to say that Jesus loves us. It's another to begin to appreciate and to understand the depth of that love. And Solomon was in a position to understand real love and fake love. According to verse 1 of Song of Solomon, it says, The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. This is Solomon's love story. This is a story of a real genuine love that Solomon experienced. Think about this. The guy had a thousand relationships with women. And out of all of those relationships, there was only one that really moved him, that he was able to testify about as a real, genuine romance. 
And so here's a guy, he knew the value of what it was to love and to be loved. Not a love as the world defines it. The world has a messed up idea of what love is. But a real genuine care and devotion to another individual and to have another individual exercise care and devotion towards you. To have it mutually built upon self-sacrifice and a desire for the betterment of each other. And so we want to look at those things here this morning. The Song of Solomon, it opens up with the first couple of verses. It's just kind of an opening declaration. It just kind of sets the stage for what is to come. And it shows the level of commitment and enjoyment that the two have together. Again, this is like a ballad. This is literally a love song. There are different people who are singing. There are different people who are playing their parts at different times. As the bride starts off, I'm going to refer to her, her as the Shulamite at this point because she's not uh, known as the bride for the majority of the book here. But she starts off talking about how important this love and relationship is to her and how other people desire what they have. In verse 4 of this book, chapter 1, we see how there are different people speaking at different times because it's kind of a call and response. As the Shulamite, she starts off the first couple of words that she says there, draw me. That's her speaking. And then you have a choir referred to as the daughters of Jerusalem who kind of fill in after that and said, we will run after thee. She says, the king hath brought me into his chambers. And then the choir responds, we will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright will love thee. They see what this man and this woman have. And they're able to rejoice in it. And let me tell you, a real genuine love, a real genuine devotion between a godly man and a godly woman, I know Solomon had his problems, but for us in this day and age, between a godly man and a godly woman, that is something that ought to be held up and esteemed. And so much the more as the world tears down the value of relationships and what real love is. Beginning in verse 5, we get introduced to the Shulamite woman. She was a resident as we piece this together. And if you go through, I don't have the time to do an exhaustive study, but if you search the, I've already run into technical difficulties here. Oh, well, bear with me here. But if you go through the Song of Solomon, if you fit the pieces together, the Shulamite woman was a resident of the town of Shunem near Mount Gilboa. There's no mention of the woman's father anywhere in the text of the passage and so we assume that the father had already passed from the scene leaving her mother and her brothers to raise her and the brothers kind of had it out for her they weren't the nicest of siblings you get to the end of the chapter and you find that they kind of bring an attack on her after the fact they kind of kept her busy they felt like they needed to make sure that she was too busy to get into trouble and she alludes to this here in verses 5 and 6. She says, I am black but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Some people attempt to read race into that. That's not what she's saying there at all. In the day and age when this was written, tents were usually made out of black goat's hair because black goat's hair, once it's fit to the tent and that, as soon as it gets wet, it swells and becomes water resistant and waterproof. And so she's saying, I've been out and about. In verse 6, she says, Look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. She says, My beauty's been marred. She says, I'm comely. She apparently felt herself attractive, but that she'd been marred. She'd been sunburned. She'd been out in the sun and deeply tanned, because she was busy taking care of the family vineyards. And she didn't have time to look after herself and her own. She was kind of the unfavored child in the midst of this. And then she encounters Solomon. Interestingly, first time she encounters Solomon, it's not as a king, per se, 
but she thinks he's a shepherd. And Solomon kind of allows that to be in place there. Verse 7, it says, Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest note this thy flock to rest at noon. She encounters a man. He's out taking care of flocks. He's out taking care of sheep. And she said, well, where are you going to be? Where can I meet you later? And note the reasoning here at the end. For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? She didn't want to appear as a loose woman. She didn't want to appear inappropriate in searching around trying to find him later. She was very careful about how, she, how their appearance was as she interacted with him. She didn't want there to be any hint of impropriety throughout this. And that is a lesson that everyone needs to take to heart, especially young people as you're beginning to enter into dating and romantic relationships. You've got to have care for your reputation. There's a reason the Bible tells us to abstain from all appearance of evil. Now note the response here in verse 8 as she gets an answer. And it's not a definitive answer. It says, if thou know not... O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tent. He says, if you don't know where I'll be, if you haven't figured that out yet, he says, go off by the flocks. Go feed by the shepherd's tent and I'll find you. And that's enough for the moment for her. And so then we move into the communications between them, beginning in verse 9 down through the end of the chapter there's mutual praise and adoration given to each other and the shepherd the man begins to build up the confidence of his future bride of his wife it says i have compared thee verse 9 i've compared thee O my love to a company of horses in pharaoh's chariots now by the way men do not ever call your wife a horse do not ever say she looks like a horse. Solomon could kind of get away with this because he was a big horseman. He brought in a lot of horses from Egypt. Horses were really important to him. But it's just a bad idea to go out there and try and liken your wife to a horse. Just don't do it. But he compliments her and he builds her up. And then in verse 12, the Shulamite resolves to keep these memories close to her heart. She's speaking figuratively there. In that day and age, oftentimes what women would do is they would get a pouch of potpourri or different spices or ointments, and they would wear it around their neck like a necklace. And it would give off a sweet perfume. She said, this encounter, and I'm paraphrasing here for sake of time, this encounter is sweet to her. It's like a sweet savor, and she wants to treasure that and remember that as things develop between them and throughout the night hours. Verse 15, Solomon continues to compliment her and build her up. And by the way, note to men, note to husbands especially, you're going to see this throughout. Solomon is always building up his woman. He is always building up his betrothed and his bride. And that is something that we must do as well. It's right and it's proper for a man to build up his wife, not to tear her down in any case. They spend a lot of time outdoors throughout this courtship, and that becomes very important later on verse 16 and 17 again they kind of romanticize their surroundings behold thou art fair my beloved yea pleasant also our bed is green the beams of our house are cedars and the rafters of fur they're spending time outdoors it's a figurative expression to the forest that surrounds them as they're out and about one thing that you will find throughout this courtship is that solomon and the shulamite spend a lot of time outdoors they spend a lot of time in the countryside. Keep that fact in mind. That'll be important later on. So they exchange love notes and letters. The scene changes in verse 3 of chapter 2. We get a different scene here. It's kind of moving from one avenue to another, one snapshot. We've seen our initial meeting. Now we're going to see the courtship develop as Solomon, the man, finds the Shulamite woman, his future bride. And... They're on a date, as it were. And the romantic relationship is developing. It's getting deeper. It's getting stronger. And the Shulamite woman is starting to, to just get lovesick, to always want to be there next to her. 
next to her beloved. If you've been around, if you've watched relationships develop, you know there's a puppy love phase, right? Yeah, there's a puppy love phase where you just start to feel those attractions. You start to feel that devotion and that care. It's not really deep yet. It's still very surface, but you just get very enamored with the other person. It's all you can think about. It's all you can appreciate. And they're moving into and past this stage here. And now the Shulamite begins to build up. Solomon begins to build up the shepherd in verse 3. It says, As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. Go out into the woods. She says, It's like I'm out here passing by the cedars, by the firs, and lo, there's an apple tree right there refreshing. Something for me to enjoy and to take solace in. Verse 4, He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me is love. Now, the word banner there relates to a Hebrew word that basically means conspicuous. It means readily seen. It was obvious. It was a flag over them that there was affection there and that there was in love. In the middle of a banqueting house, a public place, a public area. And while I don't mean to suggest that you should ever be inappropriate, I don't mean to suggest that you should ever slobber all over one another, there is a benefit and there is a value to letting your love be publicly known and allowing you to be publicly affectionate toward your betrothed or toward your spouse. Lines should not be crossed. Decency should be respected. But it's a good thing for people to know that you care for one another. It's a good thing for people to know that you love one another. That does a couple of things. One, that helps to reaffirm your care and your devotion for each other. And two, that helps keep problems away. That helps keep problems away. I've got to tell a story quickly here, and I'm not doing it to put myself on a pedestal or anything, but you share life experiences. Throughout most of my time in ministry, I've been bivocational. I've worked a secular job at the same time I worked at the church. One of the jobs that I had was janitorial in a hospital, and occasionally uh, my wife and my daughter at that time would come in, and we'd have lunch together. Eventually I moved out of that job, went to someplace else, but the funny thing is, when you're in the ministry, you end up going to hospitals a lot. And so one day my wife went in to visit one of our members that was in the hospital, and a staff member stopped her in the hallway and said, I'm sorry, you don't know me, but I, I need to make sure. She said, did your husband used to work here? And she said, my wife says, yes, he, he used to work on the janitorial staff. And the staff member said, well, I thought so. She said, you, you always stuck out to me because when you came into the cafeteria, you were different from the others. I could tell that you two really cared about each other. And that's a good thing. It helps to keep those who would interfere. It helps to keep those who would try to break up a romance and a marriage away. It doesn't completely solve that problem, but it does show it's not going to be easy. And it helps to show others that it is possible there. So it is a good thing to let it be known to have a banner over you that is love. Now in verse 7, she says, I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, that's the choir, we saw them earlier, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up, nor awake my love, till he please. The phrase, my love there, if you have your Bible with you, you should see that the word my is in italics means it was kind of added by the translators to help it make grammatical sense, to help clarify what it is. That's a little, I don't want to say misleading, but you have to realize, you have to understand there that the my love she's referring to is not Solomon, it's her own feelings, it's her own love. She's telling the choir there, don't meddle in what's going on. Don't stir up, don't shake awake my love. Sometimes those of us who have been in relationships, who have been married for a while, want to try and help young people along, want to try and help them mature and develop, we've got to be careful because there's a danger in that. She says, don't rush us along. Don't speed things along here till he please, till it's right for both of us. Let things take their natural course in this. And so... That concludes the first one. Verse 8 begins another scene here. As Solomon comes in and he surprises the Shulamite, the shepherd surprises the Shulamite and takes her away for the day. And their love continues to deepen. It continues to blossom. They continue to complement one another. 
And at the conclusion of this date, verse 15, you find a resolution that the two of them make using an analogy here. Remember that she's been keeping vineyards. She's been working the fields. It has been her job to make sure that the gardens are not demolished or destroyed by pests, by marauders, by animals. And in verse 15, the two make a declaration to each other. They say, take us the foxes. And then they go even further, not just the big animals, but the little ones, the little foxes that spoil the vines. For our vines have tender grapes. They say our relationship is young. The fruit of our relationship, the effects, the outcomes of our relationships, this is all still very young. It's very delicate. It's very tender. And they are not going to allow anything to spoil that. They are not going to allow anything to damage their relationship, whether it's a full-grown problem or a little problem, they're going to take it out. They're going to get rid of it. That's good advice for everyone. Whether you're in the betrothal period, the engagement period, whether you're in the dating phase, whether you are married and you have been for years, this is a commitment that consistently and constantly needs to be made that you're not going to allow anything to get in there and spoil the relationship. By the way, little foxes eventually turn into big foxes. Little problems turn into big problems. And they must be dealt with. They must be resolved. And we live in a day and an age where there are always problems trying to creep into a relationship. There are always foxes that are trying to keep in. You have to be so careful about what you allow to influence you. What you allow to influence your idea of what a relationship is. Television and movies sell you the wrong idea of what a relationship is. Relationships do not work the way that movies portray. Relationships do not work the way romance novels portray. It's not the way that it functions. That is not reality. And if you approach a relationship with that basis, if you approach a relationship with what social media tells you is true or what works, and you allow those things to get in there, it's going to cause damage and problems. You've got to be careful about what you allow into your relationship because if you allow a little or a big fox in there, it's going to destroy it outright. And so you've got to be careful about that. And there needs to be a day-to-day -day commitment to keep the foxes out, to keep that which would spoil the relationship out. And the two make this declaration. Verse 16, they say, why? My beloved is mine, and I am his. I am reserving myself for my beloved. My beloved is reserving himself for me. And to that end, we're not going to allow anything to come between us or to spoil us. Pay attention to this last phrase. He feedeth among the lilies. I highly doubt I'm going to get far enough for that to trigger. And you see the results of the foreshadowing, but keep it in mind as we progress here. Now, the shepherd and the Shulamite, theirs is a very infrequent romance. They've made this declaration. They've had this good time. And so now the Shulamite, beginning in chapter 3, she starts to dream about her shepherd. Chapter 3 opens up, verse 1. It says... Got ahead of myself there. By night on my bed I sought him whom my soul loves. She's dreaming about this. She's dreaming about their future relationship, their future wedding. But as you go through this, you notice a little something. In verse 2 it says, I will rise now and go about the city in the streets. And in the broad ways I will seek him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. The watchmen that go about the city found me. To whom I said, Saw ye him whom my soul loveth? It was but a little that I passed from them, but I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go, until I had brought him into, the chamber, into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that hath conceived me. She, they've spent all of their time out of doors, but when she dreams about him, she finds him in the city. That's going to have ramifications later on. She doesn't fully understand her beloved just yet. And that's one of the things that you're going to find as you spend time in relationships, as you spend time in marriage. 
you're always going to be learning new things about the other. You're always going to be moving into a deeper understanding of one another. But she finds him and brings him back home. Now, there is a lot of consternation about verse 4 there. Let me just let you know there's not anything improper in what she's saying there. She is not suggesting anything that would violate the command not to commit adultery or fornication or that. What she's dreaming about is a wedding. She's dreaming about the day when she gets to bring him home and they get to be together. If you remember, when Isaac needed a bride and the servant went off to secure a bride for Isaac and all that that entailed, Scripture is very careful to note that when Rebecca came back and met Isaac, Isaac took her into his mother's tent. And nobody reads anything improper into that. Nobody assumes that they were doing anything out of the bonds of wedlock, but that they understand that they got married and that they had uh, a future that was joined together there. She's dreaming of a wedding. She's dreaming of building a home with her beloved and with the future that's there. I would give you the reference for that, and I apologize. I'll have to get that for you immediately afterward. The uh, notes that I have out that include that reference are kind of buried on the display here, and I can't see that at the moment. So I promise I'll get that for you as soon as the service is over here, uh, where it talks about Isaac taking her to the uh, tent of his mother there. So... That is the dream that she had. Another quick tidbit of advice. It's a good thing for husbands and wives to dream of each other. And if you do, let your spouse know. They'll appreciate it. They will. It's a good thing. It's a healthy thing there. So she's dreaming about the day when their marriage and relationship, which they've started and begun, will be realized. And that happens in verse 6. In verse 6, we get another change in the screen, in the scene. Because now there's a procession that comes by. Verse 6, Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense and all the powders of the merchant? All of a sudden there's a procession coming for her. Verse 7, Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. Three score valiant men are about it, of the valiant of Israel. Now, that word bed there, that's a palanquin. You know, what the, you know the pictures of the Middle East and that? You've got the four men who have the poles on their shoulder that supports a raised platform for a ruler to sit and recline on? That's what's coming to get her here. Behold this, this bed, this procession, this palanquin, which is coming, guarded by valiant men. Verse 9, King Solomon made himself a chariot of the wood of Lebanon. He made the pillars thereof of silver, at the bottom thereof of gold, the covering of it of purple, the midst thereof being paved with love for the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O ye daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals and in the day of the gladness of his heart. On this wedding day, when he went to get his bride, his mother gave him a new crown as a wedding present. And now all of this glory, all of this splendor, all of this finery was coming for the beloved to take her away to the new life, to the castle, to the royal city. And I hope you can start to see the picture that this has, the picture that this has for us as the first time the bride meets her future husband, she sees him as a shepherd. And then they're separated for a while. And the Shulamite is left, the woman is left longing for her beloved's return. But when the beloved returns, it's not as a shepherd, he comes back as a king and takes her away. It's a very wonderful picture of what our experience is, right? The first time Jesus Christ came, he came as a shepherd. He presented himself as someone humble of little stature. And yes, he has been called away. He's gone to prepare a place for us in his father's house. 
But he's coming back for us one day at the rapture. And when he comes back, he's not coming as a shepherd. He's coming back as a king, as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And this, all of the wonderful things, all of the wonderful affection that Solomon has, that this man has for his beloved, is what and is exceeded by what Jesus Christ has for us, by what he feels for us. You look at all of the devotion on display here. You look at all of the care and affection that is poured out from this man's heart toward his bride. The love that exists there. And that's a picture of how much Christ loves us. How much he cares for us. It's an interesting thing to think about, to consider. To realize that when you go to have your devotions with Jesus Christ, when you go to have your devotions with God, this is what is being extended to you. This is the level of love that is being extended toward you. When Christ died on the cross for us, it wasn't just in a generic abstract of love. It was in a love that looks at us in such a pure, undefiled way that it seeks to build us up and encourage us and is enamored with us. And that's really humbling when you get down to it. It's really humbling to think that here we are with all of our faults, with all of our failures, with all of our shortcomings, and that God, Jesus Christ, looks at us who make up his church in such an enamored way. I can't comprehend that kind of a love that God would have for me. I can't comprehend that kind of a love that Jesus would have toward me. And yet he does. And yet he cares for us in such a wonderful way. Beginning in chapter 4, you see more of that. As the king describes his bride in terms of romantic endearment. Now, some of this we would consider outside the bounds of decency. That's just because of our culture and the way that our culture works. In the Middle East at the time of Solomon and even up to the time of Jesus Christ, it wasn't necessarily that way. Basic bodily functions, bodily anatomy was considered all right to discuss and to observe in front of anybody because, after all, you know, everybody deals with those things. Fun fact, and this has just popped into my mind, so I'm going to run with it. Apologies in advance. Don't worry. Fun fact, uh, used to be, you back up a couple hundred years, used to be that nobody in the United States really gave that much thought to body odor. When they introduced deodorants and that, they couldn't, there wasn't a ready market for deodorants. Nobody really gave a thought to it, and deodorant sales were flagging until finally there was a marketing guy who cracked the code, kind of figured out how to sell that. And what he did was, during the height of the Depression, he launched an ad campaign saying that people were losing their jobs because their body odors were offensive, and that if they conveniently bought this deodorant and applied it, they would be able to avoid that problem and keep their jobs. And you know, just over time, we've become more reserved about things. And so you go through this, not only is this culturally acceptable, but it's also between a man and his wife. And note that there in verse 8 of chapter 4, it says, Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. At this point, they're married. This is the first time the word spouse appears in the narrative. They have engaged with one another. They have performed the vows, and they are ready to move forward and to make a union in that marriage, which culminates at the end of the chapter going in to verse 1 of chapter 5. And so at this point, you would be all set for a happily ever after, right? You'd be all set for the book to close, the title card to drop, zoom out, you get those immortal words, happily ever after. Well, let me share something with you. 
in life, as long as we're on this earth and as long as we all have sin natures, there is no happily ever after. Once you get married, that's when the problems really start. <laughs> Prior to marriage, you have breaks from each other. You're not around them all the time. If someone's having a bad day, eventually you part ways. After you're married and you're together, guess what? When they have a bad day and they go home, you're stuck with them. And then you have to work through things because now you have to figure out you know, how to cooperate on your finances. You have to figure out how to cooperate with making large life decisions. That's when it really gets interesting. And one thing about those relationships, one thing about the marriage relationship is that when one party gets their eyes off of the other and starts to become concerned about what's convenient for them, that's when things start to get really rocky. That's when things start to get difficult. Because the relationship is out of wonk. And that's what happens here. You get to chapter 5, and the honeymoon is over. The honeymoon is over. Beginning in verse 2, you see that. The bride is speaking here. She says, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, note that, and my locks with the drops of the night. Apparently, for whatever reason we aren't told, the husband was late getting home. The bride went to bed. He got home. He starts knocking on the door. And apparently he's been there a while. He's been there long enough for his head to fill with dew and for his hair, his locks, with the drops of the night. And verse 3, what is her response to all this? She says, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I've washed my feet. How shall I defile them? I've already made myself ready for bed. I'm already in bed. You want me to get up and open the door? That's her reaction. By the way, let's all be honest here. If you've been married for a while, you've both experienced that, and you've done that once or twice, right? I'm going to move on. But she says, I'm already in bed. You want me to get up and let you in? And then you get to verse 4. And again, this is something that causes people a lot of consternation. You've got to understand that they're not being indelicate with verse 4 where it says that my beloved put his hand by the hole of the door. That miniaturization is a very recent development in human history. We're used to keys being, what, an inch long, an inch and a half long at most? Well, that's because we finally progressed to the point where we can make keys and locks this small. Such was not always the case. At the time of Solomon's reign, the smallest key was made of wood, and it was about seven inches long. Now, if that's the size of the key, seven inches long, imagine how big the lock has got to be. Two-way locks were also a very recent development in human history. By the way, some locks were so big and some keys were so long that you literally had to carry them over your shoulder like a rifle or a musket. So when the Bible talks about putting the key on the shoulder, they're being literal there because some keys, especially for kings and that, were that long. Two-way locks were also a recent development. Oftentimes, you can only unlock an ancient lock from one side. And if you were going to lock a door, you were going to do it from the inside, right? So if you've got a door that's locked from the inside and you've got a key, how are you going to open that if you're outside? Well, they would leave an insert in the door for you to reach in and turn the key, put the key in, turn the key, and get the door open so that you'd have some measure of safety and that. But that's important for another reason. Sometimes we lose sight of this. This is the husband's house, right? You'd think he'd have a right to enter into his own property. And when somebody starts messing around with the lock, when somebody starts messing around with the doorknob, you naturally think, oh, they're getting ready to come in. They're getting ready to break in, right? And so as the bride, her love is kind of cooled towards her husband as she's lost sight of what makes their relationship unique. And she's leaving him out there. She hears him come all the way up to the point 
of messing with the lock and then stops. Why? Because the husband loved her enough that he did not want to force his way in. He wanted to be allowed in out of love, out of a respect for her. And then her bowels were moved for him. That is, she was full of compassion. That's what, when he pulled back, that's what finally broke her hard heart. In the Bible times, they looked at the bowels as the stomach, as the seat of emotion and compassion, because if you were upset for somebody else, if you were bothered with somebody else, your stomach would start to twist. You ever feel that? And so they would look at the bowels as the source of sympathy and empathy. So verse 5, I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh. That's a reference to a courting custom at that day and age. If a man was betrothed to a woman and he went to visit and she wasn't home, he was supposed to leave a token that said, hey, I was here and I missed you. And sometimes they would perfume the door so that the, husband, the spouse would know that they had missed a visit. And so we see the husband's love for the bride in action there as he papers over what happened. Oh, you just weren't home. You just weren't here. Love covers a multitude of sins, right? So she's reminded of this time when they're dating. Again, I think that'll be important upon the handles of the lock. Verse 6, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. So why is that? He wanted so badly to reunite with his beloved. He wanted so badly to be invited in. Why didn't he respond? Why didn't he show up right away? And for a long time, that bothered me. And for a long time, when I read the Song of Solomon, I came to this. It seemed to me that this could not be a picture of Christ in the church because that runs counter to what we see and how ready and how willing Christ is to forgive. But then you read a little bit more and you find out that the bride's relationship with the husband is so damaged. And I've got to move fast here, but bear with me is so damaged that she's kind of forgotten who he is. And until that gets restored, the relationship is not there. Because note this in verse 6. She says, I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Where is she looking? Verse 7. The watchman that went about the city found me. She's looking in the city. He had just left a note from their courtship. And where was their courtship? Their courtship was always out of doors, right? It was always outside. And she's busy looking around in the city for him. He's not there to be found. So verse 8, she says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick of love. I am lovesick for him. Now this gets also interesting here. Because in verse 9, the choir, the daughters of Jerusalem, they say, well, what, what makes your beloved so special? What sets him apart from everybody else? And that leads to, in verse 10, where she describes her beloved, from verse 10 down to verse 16, in very lofty terms, in romantic terms. Which brings us to chapter 6. The choir responds, the daughter of Jerusalem responds and says, Whither is thy beloved gone? Now, wait a minute, that's what she just asked you. <laughs> she just asked you where they went. Have you seen him anywhere? She just finished describing him. Now they say, well, where did he go? O thou fairest among women, whither is thy beloved turned aside that we may seek with thee? Now verse 2, the Shulamite, the bride, speaks again. But this time, she says, my beloved is gone down into his garden, to the beds of spices, to feed in the gardens and to gather lilies. Does that sound familiar? It was really important when we looked at it back during their courtship. Where was it that, uh, back at chapter 2, after they declared that they would not allow the foxes to spoil the vines? Verse 16, it says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. Chapter 6, verse 2, My beloved has gone down into his garden to the beds of spices to feed in the gardens and to gather lilies. She realizes, wait a minute, I know where he is. He's back at that special spot that we have. 
Now this is personally me. This is my opinion here, and I admit that I'm fitting things together. This is not a hill that I die on. But my personal opinion is that when the myrrh was left on the lock, that was the husband telling her, you remember that spot when we were dating? That's where I'll be. Either way, she realizes at this point she's stoked enough, she's remembered the relationship enough, she remembers who he is enough that she understands where he is. And then in verse 4 of chapter 6, there's no travel time at all. There's no journey to the gardens. All of a sudden, wham! She's right there with her husband once again. The relationship has been restored. She'd gotten so cold toward him. She'd gotten so comfortable with her husband that she'd forgotten who he was. And only once she remembered who he was and where he would be was that relationship restored. So if the first five chapters are a picture of Christ and the church in the overall plan, I believe from chapter five up to here, we see a picture of a Christian, somebody who has a relationship with Jesus Christ, who plays the part of the prodigal, who goes astray, who loses the value of the relationship with Christ and has to be restored. And it's only once they remember only once they stir up that love and that care that they have for him that they're restored. From verse 4 onward, down to verse 10, the husband builds up once again the kinship and feeling that they have. Notice that the husband never holds the bride's actions against her. You read through this, you can do it on your own, you read through this here, and not once does the husband ever say, can you believe you left me standing out there all night? What were you thinking? I knew you were really home. No, it's just completely gone. It's completely out of sight, completely out of mind. And he's just in as much in love with her now as he was on the day of their marriage, which is a wonderful reassurance for us because We've all played the part of the prodigal at some point. At one point or another, we have allowed our relationship with God to cool. We have all failed to live up to what our relationship should have been. And it's only once we stoke that back, it's only once we remember what makes Jesus Christ so unique, so special, once we remember what he's done for us and his love for us, that we've come back to him, that we restore that relationship with him. And as soon as we do, guess what? He loves us just as much once we've come back as the day we first got saved. And it's not held against us anymore. It's a wonderful picture of reassurance here. And things continue to develop from there. As this time, the bride is willing to pursue and willingly give herself to her husband without the husband asking and being invited in. It leads them to a deeper place. I'm going to have to stop there for sake of time. But hopefully this overview of the Song of Solomon gives you some comfort about your own relationship with Jesus Christ and helps you understand and appreciate the feelings that Jesus Christ has towards you. And that the love he has towards us isn't just a high-level academic love. It's not just a fact. But it's an individualized care and devotion that he has toward you. So the next time you have devotions, next time you read your Bible, next time you go to church, understand that this is the level of love that Christ has for you. And he wants to spend this level of time with you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the lessons that you showed us this morning. I thank you for all that you've done in my own study of the Song of Solomon. I ask that you would help us to take these lessons to heart and that you would help us to apply them in the future, to have a better relationship with you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.